We listen to your spirit and connect with creation. Connect with your mother. You can talk to her and listen to her answers. You are all leaders and you were dreamed of by many holy people. You are here and as am I to lead and transform this world. And you are the seventh generation Matakiwe Oyase. I will be going outside after the morning session is done to smoke the um, chanupa and pray with it outside for the youth and our climate summit. If anybody would like to join outside, you are welcome to join. And that will be all of my blessing today. Now, thank you, thank you, thank you to Mikasa Looking Horse and the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus. Um, and I hope you realized, but what happened in here as Mikasa was speaking is exactly what is happening, right? No one knew what was going on at first, and everybody's sort of standing around, and then by the end, everybody was facing in the same direction. So all life is metaphor, right? And we're going to do much more of that over the course of the day. So. Um, our summit has been blessed, and I'm so pl pleased to say, is my mic good? Um, that we have the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Gutierrez, here with us as a keynote listener, a symbol, a huge symbol of the UN's commitment to put young people first. And he's here to listen uh, to our recommendations from the young folks and our amazing panel, but he has to leave at 10.40 a.m., so um, we should really get started. So. One more time, hello live stream audience, hello overflow audience, hello people out in cyberspace. Are you ready to officially open the Youth Climate Summit at the United Nations? Yeah. Woo! And to help me get this largest ever gathering of youth on climate at the United Nations going, Please welcome the lead for the Youth Engagement and Public Mobilization Track for the Climate Summit and co-host of the Youth Climate Summit and wearer of awesome t-shirts, UN Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, Jayathma Wickramanayaka. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> hello, hello. Welcome, welcome to the United Nations. We have been waiting for you. Thank you so much hello, for everyone. coming across the streets, across hello, the hello. oceans, across the continents welcome. to be here for your commitment. Before we start, I want to acknowledge that many of you who wanted to be here are here, but some of our young friends couldn't be here because of many barriers, including visa denial, financial barriers, and many more. So I want them to know that we are thinking of them, they are in our thoughts, and we are standing in solidarity with them as we kick off this awesome UN Youth Climate Summit for the first time. As many of you know, during the last year, like around the same time, the UN Secretary General launched the youth strategy, the first ever youth strategy for the UN system. And since then, this is the largest gathering of young climate activists that we have had here at the United Nations. 1,024 young people registered from over 140 countries. And there are thousands more watching us online and also watching us and joining us from the global watch and do parties that we organize together with the YMCAs and uh, the UN Live Museum. So very big thank you and a welcome to all of those who are joining us online as well. Either you are here at the United Nations headquarters or you are in your country, maybe in your living room, on your couch, joining us with all the comfort, the world has seen your potential. We have seen how you organize your communities. We have seen how you educate your peers, how you even educate sometimes your parents and adults. We have seen how you, every Friday, come out to the streets and demand climate action from our elected political leaders and big corporations. You know, as 
it's for so long, for so long, young people have been asking for a seat at the decision-making table. Imagine the power of the movement you have created today. The leaders are asking for a seat at your table. We have so many leaders here around this room. I see the Prime Minister of Sweden, the Deputy Secretary General, the Secretary General himself, and many ministers around this room who are here not to speak to you, but to speak with you and to listen to you. So let's make this platform. You are our leaders, and the UN has only provided you with a platform. So use this platform to amplify your advocacy, to network, and to make the global striking movement, the global climate action movement stronger. And let's make this youth summit a summit to remember, because there is no planet B. Thank you very much. Thank you to the UN Youth Envoy. And now, we're going to hear from our youth speakers. Um, as I've already said, the Secretary General will have to depart at 1040, so I'll ask all our speakers to keep their remarks to three minutes or less. Our first youth speaker really needs no introduction. She's a 16-year-old climate activist. She arrived in New York two weeks ago after sailing across the Atlantic on an emissions-free yacht. Um, and if my sources are right, she spoke to 250,000 climate strikers just a few miles from here yesterday. Please welcome, who's coming, Greta Thunberg. <laughs> So we're doing a little. Next up, now for one of our 100 green ticket winners. He's a member of Jóvenes por el Clima Argentina, a movement made up of young people between the ages of 15 and 19 who are dedicated to fighting the climate and ecological crisis. Welcome, Bruno Rodriguez. Now. From Kenya, she is the founder of Nelige Group, a conglomerate involved in media, information, and communications technology, sustainability, and inclusive development. And her work for People and Planet has earned her the prestigious Top 40 Under 40 Women Award in Kenya. Welcome, Wanjuhi Ndroge. And last but not least, he's here on behalf of Youngo, the official youth constituency at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And he works with the Alliance for Future Generations Fiji, a gro growing youth network organizing events and projects with local communities to improve landscapes and education on climate across the country. Welcome, Kamal Kumar. She, <laughs> she, <laughs> gender equity in action. And we'll just introduce our keynote listener. You all know him, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. All righty, so should we kick off with our first youth speaker? Greta, go right ahead. Um. I, I'm very grateful for being here and for being invited here. And I want to thank the United Nations and the Secretary General for, for, for hosting this event and for inviting so many inspiring young activists. And uh, um, yesterday, millions of people across the globe um, marched and demanded real climate action especially young people. Um, we showed that we, we are united and that we young people are unstoppable. And uh, I, I don't want to take up more of your time because I, I've been invited to speak in the General Assembly on Monday. So I will, I will 
give the others more time to speak now and just wish you a very good day today. And I know and hope that today will be successful. Thank you, Greta. Also, generosity in action. Um, so, with that, Bruno. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bruno Rodriguez. I'm 19 years old, and I am from Argentina. I'd like to thank the Secretary General for generating this historic event in order to include the voices of our generation in the process of building paths towards a habitable planet. The climate and ecological crisis is the political crisis of our time, it is the economic crisis of our time, and it is the cultural crisis of our time. The scientific community was very clear. We are facing an existential emergency, and our world leaders have the obligation to make radical change. But change rarely takes place from the top down. It happens when millions of people demand change. I speak on behalf of the organized Youth for Climate Students movement of Argentina. Our movement understands that no, that the power will see nothing without struggle. And that is why we decided to fight in the streets alongside the working class people of our country and marginalized communities by organizing massive strikes in front of the National Congress in order to stop the criminal behavior of big contaminant corporations and to put an end to the indifference of politicians. The diverse experiences of other countries are something we all need to learn from. And uh, there are different contexts as well as different demands. I come from a Latin American country. The story of our region is the story of five centuries of pillage. For us, the concepts of climate and environmental justice are a matter of human rights, social justice, and national sovereignty in relation to our natural resources. That is why we need to demand that the 100 companies responsible of 71% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions transition towards a sustainable path. And we can. We can make this happen by standing together and saying enough is enough. We don't want fossil fuels anymore. <laughs> Young climate activists all around the world are building a new collective consciousness. There are no frontiers to fight for structural change. Many times we hear that our generation is going to be the one in, in charge of dealing with the problems that current leaders have created. We will not wait passively to become that future. The time is now for us to be leaders, and that is why we are here, to lead. My message to the Secretary General is simple. Let's stop demanding world leaders to listen to science, and let's start demanding them to act on science. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruno. And with one second to spare, Now let's hear from Wanjuhi. Thank you. I represent voices of millions of young people in Africa whose future remain uncertain due to the climate crisis. Your Excellency. No excellency. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I was born and brought up in a village at the foot of Mount Kenya, a major water tower in my country. My community's livelihood is from farming, relying on the rivers that flow from this mountain. We had previously never experienced water or food shortage up until January 2018. We realized it was time to take action. In our response, we harnessed the tools that are at the core of young people's interactions, social media. With the hashtag Save Our Forest KE, in partnership with some of the biggest activist groups in the country with over 100,000 followers, we started an online petition to save our forests. What started as a fight for our Kafaru forest was now a national conversation. These actions led to, the, to reforms at the Kenya Forest Service, a custodian of natural resources. In addition, a national ban on harvesting of forest product, products was enacted. The government of Kenya has since launched the Greening Kenya Initiative in December 2018, aimed at achieving our desired 10% forest cover. 
to my fellow youth. It is evident that starting where we are and with what we have will cause a revolution. What we are asking for as young people. First, we appreciate that youth are now at the table where the discussions are being held. But our voices and our inputs must be allowed to influence these decisions. Second, that member states respect and support freedom of expression, more specifically, internet freedom for young people to organize and amplify their voices on, the, on matters that matter most to them, especially the climate crisis. Third, for those of us in Africa, adaptation and resilience has become our focus in our effort to survive the climate crisis. We are the lowest emitters but suffer the most. But this is not the time to shift blame. This is the time to work together. We, the over 625 million youth in Africa, therefore ask for support, especially technical, financial, and skills transfer of the youth in their action and innovations towards climate change mitigation and adaptation. As the late Professor Wangari Madai taught us, I invite all of us to be that hummingbird that puts out the forest fire by fetching water with its small beak as all the other animals, including the elephant, told her it was impossible. Thank you. Thank you, Anjumi. And finally, Kamal. Thank you, Excellency. No, no. <laughs> the United Nations Secretary General. I have to say that uh, whenever the word Excellency is pronounced about me in this uh, uh, UN uh, uh, at quarters, I ask for a fine of $1,000 to help solve our financial <laughs> problems. But uh, I, I, I recognize that uh, this group is not able to pay, so I will not uh, put the fine. Uh, but I ask you please to abolish the expression. The Secretary General, fellow youth climate justice advocates, dear delegates, Bula, and good morning to you all. It gives me great pleasure to speak on behalf of Yango, the formal youth constituency to the UNFCCC and part of the UNMGCY coordination team. We are a self-organized umbrella movement with millions of young people in its direct and indirect membership. Young people from different parts of the world are living in constant fear and climate anxiety, fearing their future, the uncertainty of a healthy life or a life for their children at all. These negotiations on climate change policy started in 1992, even before most of my generation was born. For over 25 years, and the emissions have only risen. The Paris Agreement is rooted in intergenerational equity, and today we call upon everyone, especially the duty bearers and policy makers, to respect these principles. Respect the rights of future generations. Respect the agency and institution of young people. Respect the fact that everyone from a low-lying country like mine, or a rich country like we are in, has a right to a habitable planet. I belong to the Pacific Islands, a region that has contributed least to the climate crisis, but is suffering the most impacts. Our houses are sinking, our communities are vanishing, while many countries and polluters only care for their short-term economic growth. The Earth has fundamental planetary boundaries, for many here, this may be about 36 or 70 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. But where I come from, it is about our very way of life, what lives and what dies. With due respect, between the graded IPCC graphs and multiple scenarios, things are black and white for us. Loss and damage compensation and additional support for low-income countries are still not comprehensive. And let it be clear, we are not insurance policies. We are human beings. We are communities. Is it really too much? Is it really too much to ask you to stop wasting time and walk the talk? Are we really looking forward to a future of false hopes? We young people have the following ask. We demand urgent action to phase out fossil fuels. We ask countries with high history carbon emissions and fossil fuel giants to stop hindering the walk towards the welfare of the planet for their short-term profits. Young people want to meaningfully engage with the existing movements and be supported, partner with them. 
It's been less than a year since the rule book for Paris Agreement, the Katowice Climate Package was adopted. We call upon you to engage young people in their design of NDCs, of adaptation plans, the policies which we live through. We also call upon you to urgently fulfill our commitments to the Green Climate Fund, to support Article 12 of the Paris Agreement, making sure every young person is educated about environment degradation, to enhance our commitments and for some to come back to the Paris Agreement and others to not doubt the science. And while you do so, remember, we will hold you accountable. And if you do not, remember, we will mobilize to vote you out. From youngers all over the world, From youngers all over the world, we are here in a rightful place to demand consequential climate action. While multilateralism is attacked every day, while climate denial becomes prevalent and environmental defenders are criminalized, we struggle to keep our hopes alive towards the UN and other political institutions. However, we are already demonstrating how much this planet means to us. We have posed schools, defied the odds, and risked arrest. We are working in our countries, we are leading movements, conducting research and creating green jobs. Join us. I do not want our future generations to submerge with our sinking islands. We want to give them a chance to be born, witness the diverse beauty of this planet. I hope you want this too for your children and for children ac across the globe. Vinaka, thank you. Thank you, Kamal. And now, I won't say excellency, because I'm not sure if you'll waive the fine for me as well, um, but our distinguished keynote listener, we would so love to hear your response. Well, if I am a listener, if I'm a listener, I probably would not be supposed to respond. <laughs> but uh, uh, first of all, it's an enormous pleasure to be a keynote listener when we can listen to meaningful things like the ones we heard. And indeed, I've been more times keynote speaker than keynote listener, but that is one of the problems of uh, world leaders, is that they talk too much and they listen too little. And uh, it is listening. It is listening that we learn, and is giving the possibility for all those that represent today's world to speak, and to have their voices being part of decision-making processes that we can move forward. And I'm really very enthusiastic about the leadership and the dynamism of the youth movement for climate action to, uh, today in the world. When I started two years and something ago, I must say I felt very, very discouraged in relation to the perspectives of climate action. We are already facing a climate emergency, we were seeing, I'm not going to enter into technical details about it, but we were seeing this multiplication of natural disasters becoming more and more intense, more and more dramatic, with worse uh, consequences. We were seeing drought uh, in Africa. Uh, and namely, in some circumstances, not only making communities unable to uh, survive, but being a factor of conflict, like in the Sahel, where the lack of resources in water was making farmers and herders fight each other, and because of that, uh, facilitating the emergency of conflicts and even the spread of terrorism. Uh, we were seeing the glaciers melting, the, um, the, um, the, the ice caps disappearing, the, um, the, the corals, corals bleaching, biodiversity being threatened, uh, heat waves everywhere. There was always, in the last, uh, few years since I, since I started, clearly this perspective, there is a climate urgency, things are getting worse. The worst forecasts that were made are being proven wrong, not because they were too dramatic, but because they were not enough dramatic in relation to the reality. And at the same time, there was a sense of apathy. It was very difficult to put these things on the table, and it was very difficult to make decision makers assume the need to act. There was a kind of a laissez-faire uh, in the world, and all of a sudden, I started to feel that there was momentum that was gaining, and this was largely due to the youth movement that started a fantastic, very dynamic impulse around the world, moving progressively with them, their families, their communities, their societies, and based on the societies moving, and the voice of the societies being heard, starting to have an impact on the way businesses were acting, on the way cities were acting, on the way uh, regions were acting. And finally, we are starting to see electorates being active on these and governments starting to respond. There is a change. 
we are not yet there. We are still losing the race. Climate change is still running faster than what we are. We still have subsidies to fossil fuels. We still have coal plants being built. We still have many things that are not happening and should happen, or things that go on happening and should not be happening anymore. But there is a change in momentum. I feel there is a change in momentum, and largely this change in momentum was due to your initiative and to the courage with which you have started this movement and make this movement from a small movement in front of a parliament to, uh, I believe, believe uh, it was the Swedish parliament, no, uh, some uh, time ago, into millions around the world saying clearly not only that they want change, not only that decision makers must change, but they want them to be accountable. And this question of accountability is essential. Obviously, there are different dimensions on these. There are dimensions related to grassroots movements that at the village level are able to themselves be leaders in climate action. And then, based on that, push their communities, push their societies, push their governments to act. There is the way to participate in an institutional way uh, in uh, the bodies that are uh, uh, discussing these things. You mentioned Katowice. I went to Katowice three times. You can't imagine how difficult it is to make things move when you have 193 countries and we have to have all the countries agreeing with the moves that are absolutely obvious that need to be done, but uh, there is always someone with some doubts or some questions or whatever. So we really need a very strong impulse. And uh, your impulse, the impulse of the young people organized to push for the institutional decision-making processes to move is essential. And then you have also this fundamental reflection about injustice. We do not live in a fair globalization. Uh, and the dramatic thing is, it's not the African continent or the small islands in the Pacific or the Caribbean that more contribute to climate change, but they are the main victims. It's not the poorest communities that more contribute to climate change, but they are the main victims. And indeed, there is a question of justice and the question of fairness in the way the global economy is organized, in the way power is distributed. And this is also related to climate change. So your reflection uh, uh, was, is also a very important reflection. We need to have link to link climate change to a new model of development, a model of with more justice among people and a fair relation between people and the planet. And uh, uh, when we uh, look into today's world, I think there is something that is new. We have had conflicts among people for centuries or for millennia since the human um, uh, race exists. But for the first time, there is a serious conflict between people and nature, between people and the planet. And this could be absolutely destructive for the future of our communities and for the future of our societies. And it's not only a question of glaciers or uh, ice caps or um, uh, uh, corals, even if that is extremely important, and biodiversity is a, is a vital uh, uh, question in today's world. But it is more and more about the suffering of people. And this will become worse and worse as time goes by. Lots of people are today dramatically dying and suffering because of the impacts of climate change. So we have no time to lose. It does make sense to go on subsidizing fossil fuels. Some people present the subsidies of fossil fuels as a benefit to the population. No, they are done with taxpayers' money, with our money. It doesn't make sense that our money is there to boost hurricanes, or to bleach corals, or to destroy communities, uh, like the ones that were mentioned here in Africa. Let's make sure that taxpayers get their money back and there are no more subsidies to fossil fuels. When people talk, oh, put a tax on carbon, that means uh, uh, more costs for the economy. Not necessarily. You can put a tax on carbon and reduce taxes on people, namely on salaries. And with that, you help solve the problems of unemployment, namely of youth unemployment. So there is a win-win strategy that is possible. If you combine at the same time climate action with a fair globalization with the Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals, and our plans for a more fair and just world uh, uh, in which uh, the resources can be better distributed and better used. And I believe that what the youth is doing today, what grassroots movements are doing today, is absolutely essential for these to happen. I encourage you to go on. Some people say, oh, 
it's very dangerous, very complicated, all these young people, uh, be careful. No, I'm not careful at all. I encourage you to go on. I encourage you to... <laughs> keep, keep your initiative, keep your mobilization, and more and more to hold my generation accountable. My generation has largely failed until now to preserve both justice in the world and to preserve the planet. I have granddaughters. I want my granddaughters to live in a livable planet. My generation has a huge responsibility. It is your generation that must make us be accountable to make sure that we don't betray the future of humankind. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you to the Secretary General of the United Nations and our amazing panel, Greta, Bruno, Wanjuhi, and Kamal. It has been wonderful to hear from you. So, I think we have a little video transition, but while they're queuing that up, did the Secretary General of the United Nations just credit you all with the momentum that's happening in the climate change movement, climate action movement right now? Did that just happen? It sure did, you can cheer for that. <laughs> And did he also do an amazing impression of a crotchety old person standing in your way? That I will carry in my heart forever. So, you are literally seeing history happen here at the United Nations, and this is what happens when we bring young people into this amazing building. So, more to come. You can always cheer for that. And now we're on to our next thing. This, you guys are really seeing behind the curtain here. Things are happening quickly. So, we've got a great start, and if you're ready for more, we've got three questions that they're gonna throw up on, <laughs> on their slides. Someone run over here and tell me what you want. <laughs> this may in fact be because we are ahead of schedule, can you imagine? In this downtime, please tweet and post. All right, so we're saying goodbye, we'll just let you go. Please thank you again to the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, and our panel, Greta, Bruno, Wanjuhi, and Komal. This is like the Golden Globes. 